We just live right now, man. It's going down, excited for the season. You know, we coming off a playoff win. I mean, you know, we had a couple wins. Hello and welcome to episode 167 of Dear Diaries, a Milwaukee Bucks podcast hosted by us, the members of Brew Hoop. My name is Riley Feldman, one of your usual co-hosts. Happy New Year to everybody who's tuning in. Uh, we've been off for a couple of weeks with the holidays going on. I was out of town. Kyle's been all over the place. Uh, Adam said everybody's been all, been all over the place. Uh, some of the Bucks, we'll talk about that in a minute, but I am joined as per usual by my friend Kyle Carr. Kyle, how are you and how are your holidays? The holidays were busy, but good. Um, my oldest was born on Christmas, so it's a lot of a balancing act. But um, the weekend before was with Emma's family. So that was kind of nice where we had that Saturday and Sunday. Monday morning, we did a family Christmas. And then the afternoon, we did a birthday party for Sterling. And then we went, then drove to Waukesha to do Christmas with my parents and my brother on that Tuesday. And then hung out Wednesday, came back Thursday. So it's been... A little, a little busy, a lot of driving between Madison and Waukesha, which thankfully it's not too bad of a drive, but I'm kind of getting sick of it at the point. But yeah, otherwise, holidays were, they were good. Otherwise, it was just quiet, relaxing. Um, I had the whole week off of work, so that was pretty nice as well. How was your holidays? Mine were good. I I was also in Waukesha County driving back for the went down to Milwaukee a couple of times. The thing with Southeast Wisconsin, and this is the way it is in most of the Midwest is no matter where you're going to drive, it's at least a 20 minute drive, even if it's the city over. So I had to drive from Sussex to Waukesha, from Waukesha to Sussex to Milwaukee, from Milwaukee back to Waukesha. <laughs> and I not just went, I mean, I went down to Milwaukee like three times throughout the week. So I, and then to drive back from the Milwaukee area back up to uh, Minneapolis or the Twin Cities was great. So um, it was good. It was busy. And then, uh, but that's okay. We got to see a lot of family and stuff. And uh, we also had dinner with some friends and then went to go ring in the new year at another friend's house. So we, we it was busy, but it was good. Relaxing too. So uh, relaxing for us, not relaxing for our Milwaukee Bucks who since the new year began, have gone one in three. Uh, we will talk mostly about the games of the past week. Um, because they've been bad, and we love talking about bad basketball on this program. So I'll just run through the scores as usual before we get going. So we started the new year, January 1st, hopes, dreams, resolutions, everything immediately out the window at a home game against the Pacers. The Bucks lose that one, 122 to 113. We say, okay, you know, Dame got a little too do wild at, at Silk. Things were getting, you know, dicey. No big deal. We, we say too we'll many go, times we'll a joke cats, you know, it happens. <laughs> We've all been there. We understand it was the most, you know, our hearts went out to the players for that. We say, OK, we're going to go to Indianapolis later that week and we'll get our revenge for sure. And we got absolutely blown off the court in the second half of that one. Another loss of the Pacers. <laughs> Uh, the fourth loss in five games, 142 to 130. Uh, people start looking a little askance. Uh, then we go down to San Antonio the night for that. Get a win. National TV, the first Giannis versus Wemby matchup, 125-121 for the Bucks. And then we finish the week on a low note heading down to Houston. Lose that one, 108-112. So one and three since the new year. Um, Kyle, let's just get right into it. What's, what's one thing? among many that we will get into that you learned about the Milwaukee Bucks this past week. I, anyone that has been following knows my stance on a particular player and how I generally feel about this player. I probably am the anomaly. I, I'm the, I'm probably the exception to what people view, but I don't know if I can continue rolling with Malik Beasley as the fifth starter. I have said before he is fine. I have said there's nothing wrong with him being the fifth starter. But it this past week was kind of a damning kind of showing. It's like he his minutes were like 37 against the Pacers, the New Year's Day game. But then after that, I was 23 in the second Pacers game, 27 against the Spurs, only 16 against the Rockets, and in particular, the Rockets game, Andre Jackson Jr. started in his place to start the second half. Um, and Malik Be Beasley literally took one shot and made it 
so good on him. But it, it's just been a very not great um, showing. I mean, he's still shooting the ball relatively well, but I think teams are really – and granted, playing a team like the Pacers – who explicitly will exploit him did not help. And I think this is where we're starting to see when it gets to matchup dependency, maybe uh, having Andre Jackson Jr. Be that starting two guard and put him in the starting lineup. Maybe if Jay Crowder comes back, the Bucks might mix it up with him. Could even see Marjan just depending on the situation, but I'm starting to cool a little bit on the Malik Beasley as a starter situation, not necessarily because I, I think he could still provide value with that starting group just to provide a high octane offense. But as we saw, it's just, there's too many, this team is still way too flawed defensively. And if the offense can't really get going, it really makes it hard. Like, yes, you can try. And I know Yana said it like, yeah, you can try and score 120, 130 all the time. But if you are incapable of doing that, as we saw in the Rockets game, then you're kind of like, oh, crap, what do you do? And you have to play defense and get back into it. And that's not where Malik Beasley thrives. So still, like, I still hold out hope. And again, it's not as though he's not shooting the ball well. Like the first Pacers game, he was four of eight, which that's a good showing. Two of five, the following one, two of four against the spurs so it's not as though he's not shooting the ball well and so that's kind of like okay if you can't hit your shot get out it's just now a matter of if milwaukee wants to try and get some balance back to okay being an average defensive team but still being a super high octane offensive team you might have to look at a jay crowder or andre jackson jr to getting him into the starting role were you was your estimation of malik hurt or helped by him being, for whatever reason, the guy that Chris Haynes went to for the for the infamous post second Pacers game interview, and Malik said, "Oh, there's going to be they're essentially waking a sleeping giant. So they don't know what they they're running into if they play us in the playoffs." So how did you feel about Malik's exclusive one on one with with Chris on that one? <laughs> you know, did, is it possible that he was the one that leaked it? Like, did we ever, it, it, could that be the theory? But I, I mean, I had no problem with it because I think it is one of those where that Pacers team was talking a lot and they have just kept talking and to lose four out of five, it is going to be that annoying. It's kind of like that annoying little brother where you, you want to put them in their place. So I think that's where that comment came from, but it didn't hurt anything. But at the same time, Malik, like you can't be more or less getting benched for a whole second half um, after after that kind of game. <laughs> um, and I believe that benching happened in the game following the comments, which is a nice cherry on top. On, on top of all that, I believe, Malik, uh, that the team would take it very personally the way the Pacers were flaunting and stunting on them. Uh, I know some people are upset. If I was a Pacers fan, I would be like, hell yeah. So I can't really. If oh, it was yeah. the Bucks who were doing that, I'd be like, this is the, and you, I mean, you're the pettiest person on staff. Of course, you'd be you'd be loving it. So that's when they when they go low, you go lower. So <laughs> you know what? It, it, you got to tip your hat if you're going to be petty. Be petty, and I can't. <laughs> as much as I don't love the Pacers being petty, they they have earned the right to. I, I have to at least acknowledge that. Yeah, um, I believe that. In, I believe it was in the interview with Haynes as well that. Malik talked about how he had offers to go to a couple of different contenders, might have made some more money elsewhere if he wanted, and he decided to come here because of the idea of playing with the vets that we have and the ability to start as well, which I think confirms without really actually confirming that more or less he was promised a starting spot, which is fine. You know, we have the record we do. We're still at the upper echelon of the each, so it hasn't hurt that much, but that transition period, assuming that Malik is maybe not long for the starting lineup. That'll be curious how Griffin handles that. I tend to agree. I think what we're going to do with Malik is a lot more like the Spurs game where he will continue to get the run early to see if he's got the, if the shot is falling, great, keep him out there. This will be Bryn Forbes all over again, except their defense was better. But you run him out there to start, see how it works. If it gets to the point where in the playoffs, every single playoff opponent is running them off the court, then yes, then you pull them and then you adjust from there. But up until that point, I don't think the first 
five to six minutes. We're not getting blown so far off the court that it's like, okay, well, the game's over. That's not the case. You can give him the first, most of the first quarter to get a sense how he's feeling that night, and then you pull him. Um, and then if he's having a bad night or the defense is that bad, then yes, you, like you said, you go to Andre Jackson Jr., you go to Marjan, and you see what happens there because they're just going to give you a different look. Um, but I believe the idea that at some points through 40, 30, 40 games, a starting lineup with Malik in there and Dame in there in particular, with all the disorganization, with all the issues on the defense, is going to work itself out. I, I think we have a lot of evidence now that it's not going to be the case, um, which is survivable. I don't, I don't want it to seem like we're going to lose or lose one or win only a quarter of the games from here on out because Malik is starting. This is just kind of particularly bad run. Um, but that does throw another wrench in the plan of how and how we need to adjust. And maybe it'll be for the best because you iterate forward. But um, yeah, the, the defense is just horrible. The Pacers games, Pacers are well designed to take advantage of us in particular. Uh, Rick Carlisle clearly knows how to take advantage of the defense we throw out there. Um, but that's going to be a problem against any offense or any yeah opposing offense down the line. So um, we kind of just have more stacking up evidence. Uh, but you don't... It, do you think that Griffin will pull the plug eventually? Or do you think, or you, am I like kind of in the right direction where we keep keep to it for the regular season, just kind of see in the playoffs? What do you think? I could definitely see. Yeah, I think he's still going to start, but I wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't part of closing lineups or if it was kind of similar to the Spurs and Rockets game where it's like, okay, see what he's got early on, and then you might not see him for most of the second half. So I can see it more on that end as opposed to just completely taking them out of the starting lineup. And that, again, that's, it makes sense when, and also we have to consider when Malik Beasley signed, it was going to be Drew Holiday next to him as the guard. So he essentially would have replaced Grayson Allen, which would have been fine. Maybe Drew would, and again, a lot of it is how much would Drew mask what's going on? And I still think even with Drew Holiday, this scheme probably gets exploited to an extent, maybe not as badly, but still does. But at the same time, the offense would absolutely crater to non-existent level. So I think Beasley will still start, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's seen less in the second half and definitely not in a closing lineup. And the things we should remember as well, early in the season before Jay was hurt, Jay was getting run out there as part of the closing lineup. And I believe Malik was the guy that was, or he was, uh, I'd have to go back and look if Malik was, but I, I would imagine a world in the future where Jay is the one who slots in and then you kind of see who that two guard is. I would be curious there. So Jay is probably going to be part of any small ball lineup. Um, and then you kind of see, so Malik doesn't necessarily have to be out there um, as a closer. I think we have optionality once Jay is back, depending on how he's doing. Um, and then the other thing, and you were kind of talking about this before we started recording, the bench needs some sort of scoring lift at all. I mean, we've gone through new, this past week was the worst offenders, but if you go and look at the stats for the season, the only guys who are really scoring off the bench are Bobby and then Marjan through, and Marjan is kind of like a little bit of garbage minute padded in there as well his scoring total and it's not great by any means it's not like uh astounding numbers but it's pretty much bobby so you wonder if you put malik if he's running through bench lineups primarily does that utilize him better as as his main skill set offensively that's something to consider too it's not like he's going to get demoted into oblivion he could get demoted to something more like a six man and just take a million shots which is what he's here to do so that's it's, it might be a better fit ultimately for the role he can play on a team like ours the only tough part is if in that theory it's like the good thing with Malik Beasley being out there with the starters is you can't just have like you can't just double him like I, that's my only concern with him being part of the bench unit is okay we can just double him we can make sure to play tighter on him because then you know if he's out there with like a Bobby let's say Chris Bobby and Brooke and then maybe Dame or Cam Payne like okay we can just i we can keep an eye on beasley we can make sure he doesn't get any shots off so i think that's my only concern would be uh, would defenses be able to know like okay there's only bobby and beasley out here that can actually score so we're just going to focus on them as opposed to when he's with the starters like well you can't really not focus on him because it's like you got Giannis, you got dane you got chris you got brooke all to focus on as well yeah um that point kind of leads into the thing that i learned this week which was something that has kind of been sitting in the back of my mind with the struggles struggles between Giannis and Dame offensively is 
even though the offense is great, it's still, I believe it's second or third in the league overall for the season uh, offensive rating. Um, This past week and the past five games, I should say, they dropped down to 18th in the league in that five game sample. So small sample, but the offense has taken a step back. And for the first time, I was like, even if our offense is great, are we really like, are we sure we're totally free of having moments where the offense is really bad in the playoffs it, the, the what really stood out was yes the rockets game but the pacers while well, in the second game on the road in indiana second half very close game the bucks actually have a two-point lead at the half you say okay they're going to come out firing this is like we can get revenge on their home court blah 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 and in the third quarter the offense was horrible it was really really bad and the pacers were stunting us real bad the turnovers were not great but it's this weird spot where I would need the input of Blazers fans, people who have watched Dame a lot, of his off-ball presence is not, he doesn't do a lot, which is fine, I guess, but he shouldn't be off-ball a lot. And there is the conundrum of trying to get the Giannis and Dame thing to work because Giannis wants the ball a lot because Giannis is used to having the ball a lot. And Giannis is like good with the ball in his hands. He's not a top tier guard. He's not a point forward, like a Jokic obviously, but he's, he's good with, with the ball in his hands, what he does attacking the open court. But then Dame kind of sits to the side. There's not a lot of off ball movements. I kind of envisioned him as this on ball, like really intense, a lot of good dribble moves, create his own shot, obviously, but create for others. And he, he racks up the assist, but it's just like, I'm not sure if the fix is here, uh, unless you think the fix is we're just going to get a shitload of free throws in the playoffs, which that's not the worst idea in the world. That is something we could go to. Um, but this was the first week where I was like, even our really good offense might struggle a lot and our defense has dropped back down in the bottom third. And I just, I don't see the fix coming there. So I, I'm just concerned that the offense has the op- the possibility of really slowing down, even with great individual creators. Um, and so if we can't rely on the offense to boat race people, where does that leave us long-term? Um, so that was, that was my main concern is this Giannis Dame experiment coming together, still taking time, understandable, but, we seem to be taking Dame out of play in ways that will be detrimental down the road in the playoffs in particular. Yeah, it's been interesting just to see. And we've seen a couple games where Dame kind of just takes a back seat. Um, and I think the I think the Chicago Bulls game where he only had like one point the whole second. Like that's a great example of like he just suddenly took a back seat and it was and it's just confusing because it's you sitting there like, why would you not get him more involved? And part of it and the Rockets game was definitely a, a stark reminder of sometimes when Dame's shot isn't falling it really does hurt the rest of the offense because then in, instead of him being able to stretch on the floor with the shooting you're kind of, he's kind of hoping to get to the lot free throw line more frequently again not a bad strategy but when you're da- when you're down 20 something points having that ability to kind of catch fire like he can is super helpful and there wasn't a lot of off ball movement for him there wasn't a lot of trying to get him good looks. And that kind of was, a that was the part that concerned me a little bit more. I know with someone like Dame, he is going to be streaky. You know, he's going to have a couple game stretch where he's going to not shoot the ball well. And you, you have to live with that. And there's going to be games where he's going to come out on fire and it's, or he's going to have a stretch where he can get eight points in a minute, you know, 15 points in a quarter, something like that. But it is kind of curious as the game slows down come playoff time. You were kind of mentioning, are the Bucks offense going to be able to boat race people? And it's like, I still think so, just because there's too much quality that Milwaukee has on the offensive side. And then you're kind of looking like, okay, you're probably not going to get as many other guys involved. You know, you're not going to have Bobby Portis taking as many shots. You're not going to have these lineups that are, Bobby and four guards, you're going to start being more dialed in and it's going to turn more into, okay, our best players against your best players. What do you got? And Milwaukee still has enough of the better players against most teams that it should be enough. The only concern would be if Dame shot is falling, 
where's your second offensive line? This is where, you know, if we can get Chris back up minute wise and get him going, that'd be good. If it's get Brooke the ball near the rim, that would be nice. But I, I still think it's there, but I def- this week was kind of a reminder of, okay, the Bucks do need to, you, we can't expect them. I mean, they scored 113, 130, 125, and 108. So that seems not bad, but when you look at other games where they're dropping 140s and 130s and 120s, you're kind of like, oh, it's things are slowing down, and it's a bit of a concern, and especially if that bench is not going to give you anything worth a damn. I'm looking right now. You know what's got me really fucked up, Kyle? This has really got me messed up. We literally, we took Drew Holiday in our mostly stupid offense of a year ago. My turn, your turn. We'll just kind of figure it as we go. Took Drew out, put <laughs> Dame in. Dame is averaging more uh, points scored, uh, but I'll just run through his number. So he's a- averaging points scored with us 25.1. That's greater than I think uh, Drew had like 19 point something. So uh, Dame is averaging 6.9 assists a game in 35.4 minutes played. Uh, let me grab his assist percentage. Assist percentage is 27%. Hilarious. And then last year with us, the final year of Drew Holiday, uh, averaged 19.3 points uh, in 32.6 minutes played a game. 7.4 assists. Hilarious. Uh, and then the uh, assist percentage was 34.4. We swapped out Drew Holiday, who... Uh, had his like in the regular season very serviceable to very good offensively as a guard brought in dame dame is scoring more raw points but he's creating less his three-point percentage is worse than drew's was and frankly the way we play is like the exact same way as we did a year ago it's it's what i i guess i'm just having this cognitive dissonance of i thought Dame would come in and he's like a true point guard and we're going to see like cool, like creation for everybody else. And the truth is Dame can create for others, but he primarily creates for himself. And it's like, God damn it. I can't believe I'm just here. You would think, okay, we got Dame instead of Drew. We have a whole different coach. (laughs) We're fine. It'll be different this time. (laughs) We're going to have a, we're going to have a new approach. And, and to be fair, the, uh, the offense rating has has borne that out. Um, Giannis is obviously playing out of his mind. Dame is playing great. He's not scoring as much as he did a year ago, but obviously totally different role, this adjustment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not the end of the world, but I'm getting Groundhog Day vibes because we took our point guard from last year and stylistically we're doing like, it seems, it feels, it, when I just think about it, of, of course, obviously, if you watch the game, it's different, but um, it's just like, oh, we're just doing more kind of like my turn, your turn BS. It's just... <laughs> really annoying and there's so many extenuating circumstances around uh dame's transition here things going on in his personal life whatever he's actually going to be out um for tonight's game against the jazz when the podcast comes out for personal reasons um so there's a lot of stuff going on i i give the guy a lot of grace but um it's just got me messed up thinking about it. it's like I've, I've seen this offense the bad offense that we've seen this past week in particular i've seen this offense before and it's the offense we've run the past three plus yeah. seasons uh and that's mildly concerning because that offense didn't help us in the playoffs so i'll tell you what <laughs> and you know when you think about it, it's like this past week that offense looked rough and a lot of the time you just had to sit there and go huh why did the offense look like it did not know how to play basketball and it's like oh yeah let's look the rockets game nine of 34 from three okay that, that's not great but you know we, we will recover spurs game 12 of 34 from three 35 percent like and they barely got through that game. And you're kind of thinking, okay, Pacers, 14-37, 37%. The second game, the one in Indy, and then the one in Milwaukee, 10 of 40, 25%. <laughs> and that's where it's like, okay, the three ball isn't helping either. <laughs> and the defense is so bad that I think the Pacers made like, what, like five threes or something? In the first yeah, in the New Year's game. I mean, they're, the New the, Year's Day game. Yeah. They made yeah, five. I mean, they made like essentially like 1980s, 19, yeah, 1980 style three point shooting, and we still lost. So, I mean, the defense is that bad against the Pacers in particular. But, um, yeah, I think this is like if you're looking for weeks to find things to circle and be like, it's a little concerning what's happening here. This is a good week. Uh, before we move on to Buck, Ho- Buck the host, I just want to read real quick. So, um, in addition to the offense, uh, 
uh, we continue with the defensive issues. That's that's obvious. N- nobody's surprised by that. Um, and we get we've gotten more quotes this season from Giannis being like, "Hey, we got to try and figure something out uh, than we have in the past." So um, there's a quote I believe after the Rockets game, Eric Name had it, um, and I'll just read it here real quick. So. Um, and Dacumpo said, now defensively, we have to have a plan. What is our strategy? Are we going to give a lot of open threes? Are we going to let them get in the paint? When they go into the post, are we going to stay with ours and play one-on-one? What is our strategy? Right now, we are giving everything. We are giving everything. We are giving the threes. We are giving straight line drives. We are letting guys play in the post and get comfortable. We're giving offensive rebounds. The quote goes on from there. But like with Giannis ripped him, I believe Chris also kind of ripped the team as well. Um it's such such a strange season. It's like we'll, we'll win a whole bunch. Is like doesn't even feel super hunky dory. And then like kind of, things kind of go sideways, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> so so I thought that. And then Giannis also said that he uh, he thinks about losing to the Pacers before he has sex. So uh, there was a really good Which, week for for. We didn't need that, Giannis. Giannis. We didn't need that. <laughs> no, we didn't need that. But we thank him for being honest. So um, not only is the offense a little iffy, but. We continue to have active doubt from players, especially Giannis, about the defenses being played, um, the interplay between personnel and effort, the way it's executed, what the strategy is. They, it sounds like their guess is as good as, or our guess is as good as theirs as to what the fix is, uh, which is, you know, from the outside looking at, I'll be honest, mildly concerning. If, <laughs> if I can just be honest about the situation, so. It's one of those where it's kind of like, what exactly is going? And again, what is the fix? I don't think getting a new coach is necessarily going to fix a lot of the issues. I don't know how much a change of personnel is going to fix a lot of the issues. I don't know, and everyone keeps looking at the guards as part of the problem. But at the same time, it's like there are games where Brooke just cannot play. Like there are games where Brooke Lopez cannot help this team, and there's no backup big that can fill in that role. Unless you do Giannis at the five, I don't know. This is, and this was kind of the concern I had is, all right, you got Giannis, you got Brooke, you got Bobby. We know defensively that could be an issue. Maybe with Adrian Griffin's scheme, it can mask a little bit of the issues. But now that they're kind of going back to the zone drop, it's like, okay, now where is this perimeter defense coming from? Where is this rebounding effort coming from? Because this team just keeps allowing offensive rebounds left, right, and center, and that is hurting them. In the Rockets game, there I think there was like two or three times where the ball, Houston misses it, it's going up, and I one time, Brooke is just, I don't know if he was actually hustling, but it looks like he was just moving in slow-mo, and then the Rocket player got it. There's another time, Pat Connaughton and Dame both kind of just like half ass went to the ball, and then it went to a Rockets player, and they got it down low to, a pat, uh, to the post, and they got a layup out of it. It's just, even that, it's kind of like, where do you, I don't know with the defense, there is no simple fix. And I think that is part of it is why I'm, it's kind of like, okay, how much of this can really be put on Griffin? How much of this is on personnel and how much of it is these guys just do not care enough and put in enough effort because it, watching the first half of the Houston game and watching the second half was two completely different halves of actually carrying. And a lot of it was because Giannis and Andre Jackson Jr. Set the tone while in the first half, it was kind of, uh, eh, all right, whatever. And this is a rocket team that had played the night before. So you would think, the legs, and maybe the part, that was also part of it, is the legs started giving out for Houston, and they had built enough of a lead. But I don't know. I, it is a little weird. I don't know. And maybe Giannis is saying these quotes because he also knows this is on him if things don't work out because he is the one that vouched for Griffin. He is the one that has to answer the questions. If it fails, like, all right, you wanted this guy. Uh, can you explain why? Mm-hmm. So maybe that's why Giannis is also being more forthcoming and talking more. The, the way that I think about it is, okay, Imagine any any point of attack defensive guard you can imagine. Like think of the top tier guy, whoever it is. Like a lot of people are throwing out Alex Caruso is one of those guys. I don't know if he's like the top tier, but like just imagine like okay, we have a really great point of attack defender, and we throw him in the starting lineup. Is he really like? Is that guy alone going to be able to fix what's happening out there? He's going to help. No, <laughs> but there's no yeah. way. Like that's that's the hard truth we're looking at is even if John Horse goes out and trades a couple of guys for like defensive help in particular, I'm sorry. Like we, we don't have to lie to ourselves. It's not going to fix how things are going. And what's strange about the effort to me is there's not 
putting in effort because it's one of 82 and like you're trying, but you know, if things get really out of hand, you're, you're not too worked up about it because it's 182. Like there's, there's, it's a long season not trying. And there's like, I just don't care at all not trying. And we've saw like, like <laughs> excuse me, way more instances of that this week, this season, Brooke in particular. And part of it's like, is Brooke protesting? We had that Obi Toppin put back dunk uncontested off the free throw miss from Miles Turner that Brooke just didn't even try at all. He didn't put a body. I was like, okay, I mean, <laughs> and it's just this really weird vibe. I don't, I don't understand it. And it, it does feel to me um, qualitatively different from I, it's okay because it's one of 82. It feels like actively trying to sabotage or send a message or whatever and when you have the players trying to send a message to the coach with their play, that's just not a recipe for success. So there's 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 a double thing of we're not going to get the personnel. No matter what personnel we get, it's not going to fix the defense overnight. It could help, but it's not going to fix it. And the effort mismatch between what even just baseline expectations is way off from what I've expected in the past. Um and that's it's an interesting thing what you pointed out. We have the Rockets game also in the Pacers game. We went small ball lineup. Um, Andre Jackson Jr. got run in the fourth quarter with the starters and they clawed their way back. They got it within 10. They weren't able to get there, get over the hump. But that small ball lineup was able to claw back. And that's OK, because we've discovered in the past that there are just certain times where Brooke's not going to play out there. And Brooke has not had an issue as far as we're aware with that, because some lineups are just better with them not out there. Small ball lineups are there for a reason. Giannis can play center for a reason. So um, there's just a lot of weird vibes, a lot of strange. And even when we were winning, it was like, we're winning, but is it kind of like in spite of ourselves? Is this really replicable? All that. Um, and the record makes it difficult to really get a good evaluation because we still have a good record. So what's there to really work? And like, if you look at the 10 losses, five of them are against, like four of them against the Pacers. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, all right, well, <laughs> yeah, uh-huh, yeah. four against the Pacers, one's against the Celtics. So it's like, ah, uh, yeah. I don't know, like the other three, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> like, who knows? I, and we're going to find out a lot about this team too, because the schedule does get a bit harder in the in the near future. Um, Draymond Green's coming back to kick people in inappropriate places. The Celtics are coming to town. The Jazz have playing, been playing not bad. The Kings are obviously one of the better West teams. So we're going to find out a lot soon about what like what this really is once adversity hits. But um, what we learned is Malik Bars- Beasley may not be the the ultimate starting two guard, and the offense is also a little dicey, which is uh, not good. Anything else you learned about the Bucks this week? Anything else you want to give a shout out to? Um, shout out Lindell Wiginton. We know you'll be back. <laughs> yeah. We know you'll make uh, your way back. I, I'm sorry for listeners if this is where you're getting the breaking news, but Lindell Wiginton <laughs> and Marcus Bolden got waived uh, Sunday there, but we assume Lindell will be back probably with a full roster spot sooner rather than later. So for Lindell, we'll keep the seat warm for you on the bench. Uh, yep. And if this is it, thank you for your inexplicably long three years of service with the Milwaukee Bucks. <laughs> Uh, we appreciate you. The only other thing I want to give a shout out to is whoever commented, I believe prior to the Spurs game, there was a clip of Robin Lopez um, exchanging a jersey with the Spurs wacky mascot. And somebody made the analogy of like, oh, this is like the Aaron Jeter retirement tour where Robin Lopez goes to different arenas. And instead of getting a gift from the team, the, the mascot gives them their jersey. So um robin you are a total waste of space and a roster spot and it's extremely offensive to me personally that you're on the team i'm sure you're a nice guy but what the fuck so that's that's... again as i put in the chat what is he here for and i think someone said vibes i think we don't need vibes we need a productive player that can play against the center yeah here's my that's what i need actually okay i'll hold it i'll hold it for buck the host so so we're gonna move on to buck the host it's been long enough uh, obviously we didn't have much feedback, which is totally fine. So I know you have a special surprise for the readers that you, you've, <laughs> you hinted at prior to the week. I have a question as well. So I'll let you do your special surprise for the listeners. What what are we doing? It's been a while. We haven't done it in a while. <laughs> I was hoping Adam was here so he could provide his, but it's eight man rotation time, baby. Let's go. <laughs> it's been a while. And I think we need, especially 
given the previous week, it's time. I, I think we have to. When I made the teaser, I did not expect the Bucks to um, lose back to back games. To, <laughs> I didn't expect them to lose to the Pacers again and then lose to the Rockets. Uh, I thought that would have yeah. turned out better. But yes, okay. it is time for the eight man rotation. And I have thought of it. So I will go first. Um, well, I'm, I, I'm like quick writing my, my list down. Yeah. <laughs> so we got Dame, Chris, Giannis, Brooke. We got those four. Pretty simple. Andre Jackson Jr. Welcome to <laughs> He's made the cut. Yeah, 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 yeah. He has made the cut. Yeah. I think we I think we I feel confident about it. I'm gonna give Malik Beasley still some like he's still in it. Yep. I gotta do it. Bobby Portis is really I'm really struggling with Bobby Portis at this point and whether to but I have to have some other big that can score off the bench. Just the fact that he can score off the bench. And then I will not have Pat Connaughton. So this, I think this is the first time I there's just not enough from Pat that I'm convinced about. There is still not enough from Marjan Bochamp. <laughs> I cannot believe I'm saying this. If he is healthy, I'm putting Jay Crowder in it. <laughs> I, forget, I am yeah. calling. I am making calls to Debilsi to have him come <laughs> back home. We are sending carrier pigeons over to the Andes Mountains. Yep. We it's got to be done. I will fly to Bali myself and get him from that five star <laughs> rehab resort. But Jay Crowder, y- y- congratulations! I cannot leave you off my eight man rotation, and I think that's more to do with the lack. Of good, I've seen from Pat Connaughton and campaign and Marjan Bochamp more than at the very least. I don't know what Jay Crow is going to do, but this could give me my answer once and for all. Um, for we'll do a little background for the listeners. Kyle's doing a lot of driving back for back and forth between Mitchell International. He's he, I believe he's taking Robin to Mitchell to get uh, who is it that's coming back from Golden State? Uh, Jonathan Kaminga. Kaminga's coming back. Kyle will drop off Robin, pick up Jonathan, drop him off. He will also go back to Mitchell International to pick up Jay from his flight from Bali uh, when he has returned from Kyle's exile. Um, this is really messed up, but my five man ro- or eight man rotation is the exact same, guys. I, <laughs> <laughs> I just what are we gonna do? So, um, so I'm just so let's run through the guys who who would not have made the cut. So I have the same guys. So the four really firm guys for me are the same ones: Giannis, Chris, Damon, Brooke. I think you got to do that no matter what. I think that's the group. No questions asked. Um, Payne is going to fill in on the um, Jeff T role. So that's that's obvious. Does not does not need a lot out there. Please don't mess up massively. He can score a little bit. No big deal. Um, Andre Jackson Jr., he's going to be such a wild card, and I do not expect a lot from him because he is a rookie. We have to be completely like for, forthcoming that he is a rookie. There are going to be struggles, but he brings such a different energy. He brings such a different execution, and in the playoffs for a guy who does not have a lot of minutes, you have fouls to give. You are out there to muck it up, make it difficult, Pray that the refs don't call you for a million fouls. Um, he will get called for a million fouls because he's a he's a rookie. But I, I believe in Ajax. I think he's gonna make my way in. Bobby, and we have seen Adrian Griffin just roll with it. You get two or three, like in the Rockets game, he picked up three fouls and all in the third quarter, and he pretty much played the whole third quarter. So Adrian Griffin is willing to just say, "F it, do what you need to." Yep. I, and I think that's good because that's that's exactly what a rookie needs to to figure out and work through because there's only so much you can learn in practice. Uh, you have to have the actual game reps, which is good. Bobby, solely because the bench scoring is still that bad and we do need a backup big to spell guys for a few minutes. It's not going to be a lot of minutes. Bobby's not getting a lot of run out there, but he will get some run. Um, and then Jay Crowder, because we need somebody to help close small lineups and he's the guy. Bobby's not the guy. Jay is the guy. As, as is currently constructed. Um, running through the guys who didn't make the cut, so Marjan Bochamp. There's just not enough yet. I... The, it's always been the motor with me, with Marjan. Um, I think he he looks more confident offensively now than even a couple of weeks ago, whether or not it's a blip or not, but he makes 
decisions much quicker and he sticks to them. He's not getting caught in no man's land, but the motor is still iffy for me. Pat looks done. I hate to say it. And I, I wonder if Adam was here, if he would say, Pat, you still pencil Lynn because he's the playoff guy. It just looks, it, it looks close to over, which is crazy how ha- quickly it happened. But the defense, he, even when he flies by, he barely gets up all that much. He brings nothing offensively, really. The shot is whatever. We got guys who can shoot. If he's just going to be a guy who goes out there and shoot shoots, Malik is here to do that. Right. Um, and then uh, who are the other guys here? Uh, AJ Green. I mean, maybe break glass in case of emergency. That would be an effort. See if you can get a couple shots. But again, you have Malik Beasley just for that reason. Um, Thanasa shouldn't be in the league. Robin shouldn't be the league. And Chris Livingston, uh, just toolsy guy who doesn't, he's a project. So um, it seems like the eight man rotation kind of writes itself almost. Um, it's not looking at great. this point. It's just more. Can Marjan force his way into it? I, I think that's where we're at. Can Marjan force his way into it and supplant a Malik Beasley or Jay Crowder? I, I just, I think that's where it is. Like if we had to pick nine, that would be an easy, I think Marjan would easily be our ninth choice. But when you only go down to eight, it's kind of harder to do. And I mean, when it gets to playoffs, Dave's going to play 40 something minutes and God forbid. I mean, yes, Giannis and Chris will also initiate plays and Chris will dribble it off his foot out of bounds and get like five turnovers or so as well when he gets doubled. But the need for campaign is not as high when you get to the playoffs um, as opposed to regular season where he is valuable. Yeah, I to me... The question probably comes down, so Malik is iffy because if he's going to be in the Bryn form spot, Bryn did get dropped out of the rotation eventually after the Heat series. So that could happen to Malik. Yep. Um, so there's a possibility there. I also wonder, too, with Andre Jackson Jr., because the shots, the three-point shot has come along better than we thought just in terms of pure percentages. The shot still looks wonky as all get out, but... In terms of just actually making shots, I think Marjan is a little bit further along. And they kind of replicate what each other would do in terms of physicality defensively. Andre Jackson Jr. is obviously uh, applies it much more uh, thoroughly than Andre or uh, than Marjan does. So I think there is a possibility that maybe Ajax and Marjan could switch spots as well. There's definitely not, I don't I'm not sure if there's room for both of them in the set lineup, um, but a guy could easily drop out of this. Um yeah. and ultimately based off of the way that Adrian Griffin has run rotations lately. I believe Giannis played 39 minutes against the Rockets, right? Does that sound right? Like he played a boatload of minutes. Yep. So obviously Griff has no issues with running dudes a lot of minutes. Yeah, Giannis played 39 minutes. minutes. Dame played 38. Yeah. And so, then Chris Chris had 33. Yep. Yeah, you can – there's there's no minute restriction anymore. They're keeping him – trying to keep him along. But, yeah, he's he's not on minute restriction. So there's still not even that much to have to fill. But those marginal minutes, if a guy just isn't some for some reason clicking at the right time. And I also wonder, too, we have to give credence that, one, I assume Adrian Griffin is going to be here for the full season. I don't see a firing on the horizon whatsoever unless we lose, like – 15 straight or, or something six crazy. get really like yeah there's got to yeah. be a bad streak happening. it's just a really bad streak um if i was a rookie head coach who had already fight off one power struggle i would definitely be relying on the vet guys like i i don't know if i would have the courage no matter how good ajax had been marjan whatever streaks i don't know if i would be willing to like put my neck out for with a rookie even if technically that might be so there's some weird stuff around but yeah my eight man rotation is the same guys as you um and and on paper it's not horrible but that group that core group right there we've seen has a lot of issues as well so there are flaws but at the same time the floor is still high enough that it still should do enough to get into it should still be good enough for a deeper playoff run yeah um okay well I'll force Adam to write in his eight man rotation and I'll put it in the article so we can obviously have a comparison sake because it's, it's critical to yeah. have Adam's take on this as well. And the next time is he's on, if he's in submit, we'll force him to do the exercise. So it's, it's not the worst group. It's just a group with a lot of flaws as we've seen with this system that Adrian Griffin wants to run as well. So, 
All right. Here's here's my question. I was thinking about this when I was thinking because we're starting to enter trade season now. Um, I'm an incompetent with the trade machine. I don't know who's available. I don't know who's good. I don't know who's bad. I just know that if I was to guess, the odd guys or the odd guys out look like Bobby because he just does not look like he's gelling with the group or with whatever Griffin's trying to do. Uh, Pat because he looks done and he has a nice salary slot. Maybe Marjan, depending on how Horse feels about it. Um, and there's not many other options unless we get crazy and start going for Brooke and Chris, which I do not see happening. So I don't want to ask for your trade targets. But when I'm thinking about what we want to trade for, defense, obviously. And I kind of poo-pooed the idea of going after P.J. Tucker. I still don't think you can go for like a P.J. Tucker in the trade market. You want to get him in the buyouts. But one of the other overarching needs that we need to address mid-season here is uh, spiritual leadership. Somebody, it, it feels like to me there's there's a two-track thing going on, right? So schematically, not great. That comes down to the coach and execution of the players. The coach, I can't do anything about. He's here. It is it is what it is. The thing I can do about is having players holding each other accountable and threatening to like physically harm each other to get it over the line. PJ Tucker, like for all of his limitations was a perfect fit. And he was a great guy in terms of getting people to really buy in or dig deep and give it their all in the game. Um, and I wonder if like, I don't even know what my question is, but I just wanted to kind of open up, like, when you think about things you were looking for in trades, what are some needs besides just defense? Because defense is obvious. To me, another thing is defense, great. But you look at, like, a Jeff Green. Jeff Green is is past it for the most part. He's, he's not going to be, like, a starter, starter in a championship-winning team, obviously. But he brings, like, a certain sort of, like, F you, je ne sais quoi to the whole thing. And I think that sort of veteran leadership, odd enough for an old team like us, but I wonder if you can also kind of target a guy, buy out or trade, who can give a little, light a little bit more of a fire, hold guys accountable. I, I wonder if that's another way we could maybe address some of the issues. But Yeah, I think, and that's kind of why I don't see Bobby getting traded, because I feel like he is mm -hmm. the closest that the Bucks have to that in terms of the light a fire under someone's ass kind of thing. This is also why I'm just not loving having... Robin Lopez because it's like you're not bringing the, what you're I don't know what exactly you're supposed to bring at least with Thanos it's like okay you do bring like an energy you do bring something you also are Giannis's brother so it helps having keeping Giannis in like the best mindset possible so at least with Thanos there is something but I can't say the same with Robin Lopez so I'm I think I'm still going to stick with someone they have to have athleticism I, I think that's kind of the biggest thing because as we're seeing, a lot of the issue defensively is the team looks slow. They're not getting back in transition. They're not seeming to battle or fight through screens as well. So I think just general athleticism, that's kind of why I see people wanting Caruso so badly because he has enough of that athleticism that makes him a good defender. I know, and I was when you were mentioning like who are the other like good point of attackers, I couldn't really think of much. I was like, I'm when he's not flopping around, like Marcus Smart is a good point of attack oh, guard. Man. Could you imagine that like, guy? Yeah, no, oh, I, no, I get you. I get you. No, that's exactly but like, profile. Yeah. He is like Marcus Smart is really good at it. He just flops too much for my liking. Drew Holiday is great at that. And I don't know that many others that like come to mind, but I think someone that has that athleticism, or if you get someone like a peak Montrez Harrell, someone that could just run at the rim and just cause problems and it's a big enough body that just disrupts enough and maybe that helps Dame be more of a creator because you can run this pick and roll, Dame can do a little bit more. So I would say that's kind of what I would look for is just athleticism. Yeah. And that's also why when you see Andre Jackson Jr. and Marjan, it looks the defense looks at times better because they still have enough of the quickness to kind of make up for it. But the problem is you're trying to, that's two guys who are still learning the NBA mm -hmm. and that's not going to be enough to overcome it. You know, like an Andre Robertson, someone like that, where yeah, offensively he is an absolute zero. There is nothing worth a damn for him offensively, but defensively you can throw him out there and say, okay, that's your guy deal with it. And everyone else can figure out, figure things out on their own. So I think for me, that's kind of the, 
main thing is just athleticism. I mean, yes, having a light of fire on your ass would be great. I just don't think it's going to come in the buyout market. Yeah. Like, how many of those guys, like PJ Tucker, I feel like was the exception. Like, all these other guys, like Paul Gasol, not really the guy that's going to do that. Gore Dragic, not really the guy that was going to do that. Marvin Williams, definitely not the guy that was going to do Like, there's not a lot of guys that you're going to get in that mold off of a buyout market. Yeah. And and to be fair, we had to trade for PJ to get him here. And PJ had right. he'd gotten very close a number of times with Houston, and he had the chance to finally get over the hump with the Bucks, and he was a critical part to get in there. So um, that's it, and I would love like a PJ uh, reunion with Milwaukee, but I I would not blame the guy at all if he was like fuck that I'm not dealing. So I, I yeah. unfortunately with the way we handle that situation, I think that ship has sailed. Um, so when so. My question, my follow up question is who right now trade season? Don't worry about functionally how it all works. Who's your untouchables right now? Um, I think for me, it's, honest, it's, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Dame. I think those are the only ones that are like absolutely untouchable. And then it would, and then it gets to, I would need a lot of convincing and you would have to really sell me on it. Andre Jackson Jr. Mm hmm. I think Chris and Brooke technically are untouchable, not because they're that valuable. It's just, I just don't see it happening. Yeah. So I guess those five. I would say for me, it's Damon Giannis. I've seen some people, very funny, uh, white guys with the sunglasses, avies uh, on social media asking for us to trade Dame. It's not going to happen. And I don't think that would be wise. It's that we can still, <laughs> I still believe we can make it work. It's so Damon Giannis, obviously. Um, Thanasis by extension, <laughs> um, the three, yeah. the three horsemen. Chris is borderline untouchable. It would be crazy. He's, he's the one guy where it would get really crazy. I'd be like, whoa, but he's, he's a large enough salary slot. That's the real, like, that's when you know shit's going down. If Chris gets traded, things are, things are going down for sure. Yeah. Um, and then I, yeah, I, I would say Andrew Jackson Jr. Funnily enough, I mean, this is why rookies are so fun uh you play like somewhat decent for half a season you're like he's untouchable <laughs> but i think he can't trade he him <laughs> i think he has it i think he has a little bit of it which is something we haven't had in a long time so i'd say those like the four i don't know if brooke is just gonna be like a malcontent sort of i don't know <laughs> get like the issue is replacing brooke mid-season is nigh impossible but if brooke's gonna be a malcontent yeah. his untouchability and he makes an f load of money which helps out as well so um, right. That's why that's why like Chris and Brooke are in the not necessarily because you're like that high value. It's just that your contract would make it yeah. very, very difficult to yeah. make it work and realistically for me to even like, con contemplate it. Yeah. And and also other teams wanting you on their teams or like making thinking that you would fit in their timelines because it, it would be an immediate. And, like both of you could have left and you decided to come back. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, as far as the rest of the buck for life contingent, Pat, Bobby, uh <laughs> Uh, I don't even know who else can really get traded. Everybody else is on one year deals. Sorry, but you know, as as Kyle and I hashed in the summer, there's no such thing as buck for life unless you choose to retire right. yourself. Unless you choose to make yourself a buck for life, there is no such thing as buck for life around here. So um, only only okay. those with the last name of Denakumbo or retiring <laughs> get that option at buck for life. Yes, it is literally the Adetokumbo family and Chris. Those are the buck for lives uh, and everybody else. You can pack the bag. Even Chris is dicey. Chris will get Chris. You never know. <laughs> Chris will, Chris will get his, his flowers no matter what happens to the rest of his career. He'll get his flowers. But everybody yeah. else, be ready to move. Be be at the movers and speed dial again. Okay. Well, we'll trade season's just kind of getting started. Um, and the, the one other thing, back to your athleticism point, uh, this is a really rambling podcast, but we've been away for a while, so that's okay. We're covering a lot of ground. The two-way yeah. slots, we have three of them. What's the the thing that's frustrated me most about John Horst over his tenure? Not frustrated me most. Obviously, this is really stupid, but the fact that we're not really churning through those slots at the back end of the roster is a bit has always been confusing me because two ways the first two way slot came into effect. I want to say John Horst first season, and we ran through that slot. I mean, we had was it Ballum Boy or was it Ballum Boy? Is that some Ballum Boy was on there. Yes. Bronson Koenig was there yes. at one point. I mean, we, we um, were running through that just because, and it wasn't even guys to necessarily fit a specific need for what the team needed for like a five game stint. 
because somebody needed rest, whatever it is. We were just kind of churning through it. And obviously none of the guys stuck, so it's not like really matters. But on the deep margin like that, let's just be honest. We know Lindell Wigginton was not not the answer. Like he he has the ceiling. The ceiling is not as an NBA player. There is nothing wrong with that at all. But he was, even as like a deep emergency bench guard, not skilled enough. Ty Ty Washington, really young guy, upside potential. We haven't seen much. I mean, I haven't been following the herd, sorry to say, but um, there's at least potential there. We should be like running through those slots. We should, I mean, just kind of there. Think of how many guys are out there on G League teams that I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe as long as they're not on a two-way slot, teams can like poach them actively from other G League teams, like or even abroad, wherever yeah. you want to do. There's undrafted guys all over the place. We should just be running through it to see like, is there literally a guy with a pulse who who has any sort of potential fit? Because Lindell Wigginton at age 26 and his third year of experience with the Bucks was not it's, that guy. It's not happening. Marcus Bolden, um, just kind of a weird build. He was not going to be like the center of the future. Um, we should just be running through guys. It's it's always been strange to me that we haven't. There must be reasons why, whether it's because the owners won't pay, financial thing, transactions, I don't know. Um, but that's a spot where you could look for athleticism. Like Andre Jackson Jr. fell to the second rounds because he has holes in his game. Um, and yes, you're the odds of a guy even hitting if they're undrafted or beyond or are stuck in the G League are probably even lower. But you have three slots. We already burned two of them on of brothers of players, so we should be using right. those extra three to see is there a guy here who can actually stick and can we promote them when we eventually buy one of these guys out or a trade happens and we can open up a slot. So um, shout out to Lindell and Marcus. We we respect and wish you luck on whatever your journey is, but we need to be trying through these slots. Like give a guy a little bit of time. If it ain't going to work, you're probably going to know pretty quickly that it ain't going to work. Like Ty Ty's a little different because he's young. He was drafted, project guy, but you you can find out pretty quickly, I think, for in terms of talent evaluation. So that's something, another way we could address athleticism, maybe not this season, but I wish that we would work it a little bit better to maybe address it overall. Um, so shout yeah. out, we get, we all got all the way to two-way slots, so this is, we, we went deep. Okay, any other? We're really digging into this. <laughs> yeah, we are. This is good stuff. I, I got nothing okay. else. Okay, uh, the Bucks have a four-game week. We'll talk about predictions in a little bit, but we're back at home. Competition heats up here. We're going to find out a week from now. We're going to have, I'm sure, plenty to talk about. Um, looking forward to that. But we're going to move on from the Bucks. Before we come back to the Bucks, we're going to go into miscellaneous. Kyle has some rapid-fire fire questions tonight. Go for it, Kyle. I do, I do. Are you a New Year's resolution type of person? Oddly enough, I am, yes. What Did you set one then this year? Yeah, so... My New Year's resolutions are not so much like do not to do something daily, or if I do have something daily, I don't keep myself too rigid to it. But my resolutions were um, write at least a page in my journal most days, post to my personal blog site thing most days if I can. And then my wife and I have Lisbon, Portugal uh, up near the list in terms of places we want to visit, probably not this year, but maybe next year. So I'm going to look and see if I can start taking some Portuguese courses to learn a little bit of the language. Because I didn't do any prep for Italy and Greece, and I felt really bad about that. I felt like a fish out of water because my previous travel has been to German-speaking countries, and I can hold my own there. So um, I want to work on the language a little bit to be prepared for a future trip. Those are good. Yeah, Portuguese is... It's it, it, you just have to make sure to not think Spanish. Mm -hmm. Like if it's there, if you know Spanish, you can speak Portuguese, but it's kind of hard. Like trying if you try to learn Portuguese, because I did that for um, my mind's honeymoon when we went to Madeira. But it's not too difficult, though, at least. So that's kind of the nice part. Yeah, I, I think it'll help that I don't have any Spanish background. So like my 10, like I could imagine, yes, grammatically, a lot of like those things are very similar between the two. But I think it'll help me starting from scratch and that I won't be like uh, influenced by previous interactions with Spanish, for example. So we'll see how it yeah. goes. Nothing crazy, but those are those are my resolutions. Do you have any? Did you have any? Not necessarily resolution. I, I guess I, it is more or less like I am trying to make a better effort at being present. Uh, I'm just trying to be on my phone less, trying to like, especially if I'm with the kids, like paying more attention to them, playing more games with them. So that's one of them. Uh, being there for people that I know would be there for me. Just again, 
just trying to do things that would help um and then just being happier um uh, feel like i've been very negative the past couple of years social media and pandemic really uh did a number so I'm trying to inch away from that and i keep telling myself maybe i could do, i could do a half marathon and then i keep getting false sense of overconfidence and maybe this will be the year i actually do it but i'll and i also want to get another tattoo don't know what i want yet but i'm gonna get another tattoo cool good goals those are good goals uh if you can eliminate one thing from your daily routine what would it be Hmm. and why um hmm that's a really good question. One thing for my daily routine. I'm not going to go for a work thing. If I could work from home permanently, it'd be great. But ultimately, I know that's probably not good for me either. I'm not super productive at home as I should be. One thing with my daily routine, I would love a dishwasher. I have to manually wash all my dishes, which I don't mind. I find it somewhat therapeutic and I feel a sense of accomplishment after I have a sink full of dishes and that they get all cleaned. But it would save me a lot of time and save my hands a lot of strain. So probably having to hand wash the dishes would be near the top of my. That's a good one. I I think I would just be taking the dog out. Now that it's winter, I don't want to do it. It gets dark early. <laughs> Agreed there. It's it's nice to be active, but in the winter, I'm like, I hate having to put on my jackets, put on like layers, sweatshirt, whatever, shoes, and just be like, damn. And then I'm I'm out there walking the dog. I agree. That sucks. Especially at night where it's like, I'm only out here. I, I don't want to like, I'm already in pajamas maybe. Like, I just want to go to bed. And then it's like nine o'clock. It's like, oh, crap. I got to do this. So, okay. yeah. Um, One, did, are you a snack person? And do you have a favorite snack? Or are you kind of someone that take, does like a midnight snack? I am a snack person. We snack throughout the day. My favorite snack, all-time favorite. My favorite chip is... uh the Chester's hot fries that mm. uh, it's a crime that inflation has raised the price from their flat $2 to two sixty nine. I see what you're doing. Uh, free to lay. I understand your, your approach. Um, otherwise I do like just mixed nuts and stuff. It's not for a health reason. I just like having like kind of a variety of things. So we snack throughout the day. We rotate pretty often. Nothing crazy. Yeah. I, I'm a vegetable and hummus. That's kind a good move. That's a good move. And then the last one, what was the last TV show that you binged? Uh, I don't watch TV. Um, I don't watch TV shows, but my wife just watched The Sopranos and I didn't want to say it out public because uh, I only watched in the background, so I cannot really engage people with it. I cannot speak intelligently to it, (laughs) but I was in the room for a while. She plowed, I mean, she plowed through the seasons. So uh, by, by association, I've watched The Sopranos recently. It was okay. There you go. <laughs> Mine was Great British Bacon Show. Uh, crushed that season the past week. So is is Paul? I also still on? I don't is, watch TV. Is Paul? Oh still yeah, Paul's still there. It? Okay, good. Uh, is but Mary Berry moved on, right? Yep, she moved on. So they have someone else. Her name's Prue. She's. I feel like she is definitely like supposed to be the nicer version of Mary Berry. Like she is definitely nicer because like Mary Berry can also be pretty brutal. Prue is mm-hmm. just like the nice, like, okay, don't worry. You'll be fine. Like, but does not do a good job of keeping Paul in check. I, uh, <laughs> um, I love Paul Hollywood. I love the name. I love the look. I love the demeanor. Everything about that guy is hilarious. And I like that he's like supposed to be Baking's equivalent of a Simon Cowell or a Gordon Ramsay or whatever, but he doesn't, they don't reach that level because with a Gordon Ramsay, he's at that level at all times. It doesn't matter if he's doing a solo work on any of his shows, whatever, unless it's with the kids, in which case he's nice, but he's at that level. Paul is because it's Baking. It's still, even when he's criticizing pretty level, it doesn't get crazy. So I I, shout out to the British for finally producing a critical guy who also doesn't have to be psychotic while on TV. So shout out to you guys. Yeah. But yeah, that's all I got for rapid fire this week. Cool. Shout out to you, Paul Hollywood. Okay. Uh, Fountain pens with friends with uh, me, Riley Feldman for the first time. This is special. We have a new pen. I had been promoting for weeks that I thought one of my secret Santas would give me a pen. They did not, which is fine. (laughs) They actually ironically, Two of my secret Santas got me the same gift, uh, which is fine because it was a book that I asked for. But this happens when you have multiple lists. So I went out and I said, you know what? I'm going to treat myself instead. I bought myself 
a Kaweco Perkio um, special edition. So Kaweco, uh, Kaweco is a German company. The way they would pronounce it is Kaweco. Um, and they've been around since I believe the original company was the early or late 1800s. It's been around for like over a century. Um, this here is a special edition of the Perkio, which is their introductory pen. So this is a cheap pen. I believe it was $20. Uh, you can see Kyle a little bit. It is somewhat translucent. It is yeah. marketed as being a bright red. It is more almost like a hot pink, which I do not complain about whatsoever. And I like it a lot. So it's a fine nib, which means the ink goes down pretty thin. Uh, it is a true to life fine nib. I found that German nibs are probably my favorite of the whole bunch. What I might love most is the fact that you can't really see here, but the underside here, this is the feed, this is where the ink comes through. Most of the time it's flat metal or uh, black metal. Um, this is a see-through plastic, so you can see the ink that's going up into the nib, which is really, really cool. Um, and I've never actually seen that before, so very unique to them. I purchased a bunch of cartridges to go with it of a different ink, which I will review in the future, but um, it can be tough sometimes to purchase a good starter pen because... The one that a lot of people recommend is a Pilot Metropolitan, which is a Japanese pen, which are solid, but Japanese nibs are scratchy and the Pilot is made out of stainless steel and a little heavy to me. This plastic is extremely lightweight. The way I grip it, it does not leave indentations. Um, this is my first Kaveco ever, and I think it's really, really good. So I am a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of the ink, which we'll talk about next week. But if people who get into fountain pens starter pens don't you don't have to overthink it the starter pens are there for a reason like 15 20 dollars don't spend any more than that there are so many good products kaveco is in there with not only this but the sport as well as a, is a classic of the genre um look around but this is this is a starter worth keeping this is a special edition just the design i like the translucent a lot of good stuff here so um i'm not going to give it a rating out of 10 but highly recommended for me the kaveco but uh, but very high all right where can you buy it um so actually, ironically, somebody messaged me on or uh, posted me on Blue Blue Sky asking <laughs> jetpens.com <Nice. laughs> is the spot where I typically go to purchase in the U.S. for no particular reason. There's a lot of different pen companies, but um, JetPens, they have the widest selection that I found. Um, you can easily you can do a wish list and that it'll notify you when something goes on sale, which is nice. Um, so let your, let your imagination go wild, but that's where I got it from. I think it's $30 for an order and it's free shipping. The shipping's like two, three days. It's really quick. So jetpens.com is where I personally, but you know, there's a lot of sites you can go to gold spot, a whole bunch of stuff, but this is where I got this. All right. I was going to say, it's been a while since you spoke highly of a pen, I feel like. So yeah, I, I've really, I've cut down my, my collection a lot. I think I'm down to like three pens, which is fine. That's, yeah. you know, that's the trial and error of it all. So that's what I got, but I know that not only have people have we been waiting for my pen review, people have been waiting for your follow up film review. So I'm going to hand it over to you for your for Kyle's film review this week. What do we got? Yes. So a couple of weeks ago, I did Sonic the Hedgehog yeah. because I have a four year old that loves Sonic. So uh -huh. guess what? I watch a lot over <laughs> winter break. Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Mm -hmm. um, much more chaotic, much more. I feel like it's deeper into the Sonic area just because this is where you start getting tails in the movie. You have Knuckles, you get his introduction, you start getting more of the chaos emerald aspect of it. So this is now starting to get deeper into that Sonic like lore. Like if like for those that grew up with Sonic, you really start getting it. And I enjoyed it more than the first one, probably because it like you don't have to work through the awkward like oh, are these two, like, is this pairing going to work out? It's like, oh, no, like, the pairing works out. You're not getting as much of the human character interactions compared to the first one, so it is going to be more, like, Sonic and Knuckles, Sonic and Tails. Obviously, you have uh, Eggman, Robotnik, and Jim Carrey, once again, steals the show. Fantastic. Um, it, it does feel kind of like the humans are kind of more face, and, and, like, there's a side part of it, but they're not as involved. So I think it made it, it was just easier to follow. It was just more enjoyable. And yeah, I, I think I liked it better than the first one. I don't remember what I gave the first one, so I'll give the second one slightly higher. Um, also on Paramount Plus, 
I think it's just, yeah, I think because you don't have to work through like the intro and getting through that awkward stage, it's like a little bit more of like an easier streamlined movie to follow. And with how they're teasing the third one, there is going to be a third one and it's probably going to have Shadow. So I'm excited to see how that all gets incorporated. I wonder how many other of like the Sonic characters will get included. So yeah, it was a good time. I enjoyed it more than the first one. Um, I think the humor isn't as funny, but I think having Knuckles and his more seriousness gives it a little bit more of like kind of that contrast of the dry humor. So yeah, Sonic the Hedgehog 2, I would watch it. I think it's very good that they went the direction of focusing on the hedgehogs themselves. Are they there? Are they all hedgehogs? Technically speaking, no. Okay. Knuckles is a uh, chinda or whatever. And tail. I don't remember what tail. Okay, we don't. We don't have to get too. Uh, deep. You know, Let's if Sterling say, wasn't already asleep, I would call and ask him because he would know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I just like okay. Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, Shadow. Focus on them. Like yes, the villains are there, but if I was somebody who was a fan of the IP. And like a kid is a kid's watching, you know, you can kind of create the tale. Like now that kids aren't discerning, but for the most part, you can be a little loosey goosey with it. Like people want, people want the fan service. There's a reason why the fan services are give me as much of this content as possible. So I'm glad they went that direction. And then Jim Carrey still stole the show in a, uh, even if he wasn't as front forward as in the previous yeah. movie. So that's good. Yeah. I was going to ask if uh, I couldn't remember shadow's name. So, so shadow's not in yet. But that's going to be the next time. Around. They teased it. It was like a post credit, like post credit tease. So, <laughs> okay, good. How many times would you guess over? Let's just say the past two weeks, or uh, yeah, let's past three weeks. Would you say you've watched oh, Sonic God. the Hedgehog two from start to finish, like four or five, at least? There's been plenty of times where and you, you guys started like, it and have not finished. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> that, that's but happened it, a lot, yeah, but yeah, start yeah. to finish, no, four or five. Okay. All right. That's, uh, that's beautiful. And you're, <laughs> uh, kids are awesome. I love them. Okay, good. Toddlers, well, we're looking, <laughs> we're looking forward to Sonic the Hedgehog three, uh, and wherever it leads us from there. And I'm glad to hear got a thumbs up as well. Uh, we'll close it uh, out. We, here. I will definitely go into the movie theater. I'm sure if it comes out either this year or next year, I'm sure I will be at a movie theater watching it. And then Kyle will be back here to review it with us. Uh, weekly predictions. We'll wrap it up here. We're back home, finally. Home sweet home. Not that it did anything for us on New Year's Day against the Pacers, but maybe Silk will be close tonight. Uh, we start tonight when the podcast drops uh, Monday versus the Utah Jazz. And we wait three days. We host the Boston Celtics on Thursday. Host the Golden State Warriors. Draymond Green is back. Uh, he thanks LeBron James for helping him through, and he's cured man. Uh, on Saturday, and then a back-to-back against the Sacramento Kings on Sunday. Kyle, what say you in terms of prediction this week? Two and two. Weirdly enough, weirdly enough, I think they get the Boston and Golden State games. (laughs) The Jazz Jazz and the Kings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Jazz and the Kings, they lose. Don't ask me. I I don't know why. Like, I'm not feeling great, but I I could see... Because Milwaukee did play Boston okay-ish the last time those two teams played. And I think Milwaukee's going to want to have a point to prove. And Golden State's not that good. It's true. If you really look into Golden State, they're not that good. So I think Milwaukee can take full advantage. I can see Giannis getting, you know, 45, 50 points on Golden State. Yeah. I'm going to regret this, but I'm going to say three and one. We're not going to have, uh, no, I take it back. We're going to go two and two. We're not going to have both, both Damian Lillard and campaign have already been ruled out for the jazz game. So it's going to be, Ty Ty Washington's time to shine. This is shot. This probably honestly the only reason he didn't get waved alongside his compatriots is we needed him to play guard tonight. Um, so lose to the Jazz, people will lose their minds, but it'll be understandable given the injuries. I think we will beat Boston because we will have three days of rest. I hope they'll get up for it. I believe they'll get up for it. Golden State is bad. They're not like the athleticism is not evident there that has killed us in the past against other teams. And then Chris is probably going to sit the Sacramento or have dialed back minutes uh, back to back tough. Sacramento's good. Uh, I think we'll struggle in that one. So I'll agree with you again. We're doing a lot of agreeing tonight. I believe two and two sounds right as well, but it'll be interesting. We're going to find out a lot about the team over the coming weeks and months here as the schedule begins to get a little bit more difficult, but uh, that'll wrap it up for us tonight. Uh, We got to thank you guys for watching, for listening. 
Sorry again for the break, but we'll be back on our regularly, regular weekly schedule heading forward here. Uh, like, subscribe. Uh, you'll find everything over on Brew Hoop Game Coverage, our weekly pieces. I'm not going to try and remember all the weekly pieces, but almost every single day we have a piece that goes up that you can go catch up. It's not just game coverage. Trade seasons about, upon us. All sorts of stuff. Um, send the podcast to a friend. Recommend us, if you like, to people that you like. Uh, and we thank you guys for listening, and we'll catch you guys again a week from now. Thanks for listening.